Mike has asked me to read the text that uh, he's going to be speaking from today and is in 1 Samuel 16, starting with uh, verse 8. That's 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 8, and we're going to go through verse 13. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Next, Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And he said, there remains yet, to, or excuse me, um, and, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he's tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. I asked Warren to teach, uh, to read the scriptures this morning because I've had so many people say to me, yeah, I listened to the class. Now, tell me about Warren. And I said, well, that is, uh, he's a great servant of the Lord. And uh, I just told him this morning, you know, uh, I want you to start reading the passage for me. Uh, every morning. Uh, I think people need to hear your voice more. And of course, uh, one of the things you learn in ministry is uh, you have to learn to preach, pray, or die at any moment. So that was his moment. And thank you, Warren. Did a great job. Uh, this is our fourth lesson. Uh, the Rise of David, a King without a kingdom. We began uh, this morning with our lesson at a Ziva, Z-E-V-A-H, which we've talked about in the past, a ritual feast at Bethlehem. And so we can imagine that there was laughter and joy. I mean, an important man like Samuel had come to our little town and uh, this is a big thing for Bethlehem. Uh, and yet, in the midst of all that, there's just something missing. Something quite not right. Uh, Warren Zephyrin, uh, now deceased rocker, uh, wrote a song, Searching for a Heart. That is Samuel's quest. That's what he's about. Uh, you see that verb sent there in verse 1. It's the plan. Uh, the sons of Jesse. And he needs to examine them. And so he traveled a distance to get there. And these sons of Jesse all appear before him. Verse 8, there's... Abinadab, and then verse 9, there's Shama, And like a procession of graduates that go before him, verse 10, all of the sons pass before the prophet. But nada. No. Nothing. Zero. Now why would the Lord do that? He ordains all the things, times and the places. Why would He do that? Well, He does it for our instruction. We can learn from that. And I hope we see that some this morning. You travel to a place 
under the direction of God, and you get there, but something's missing. Happened to Elizabeth Elliot. Traveled a great deal of distance with a tiny baby in tow and her son, her husband Jim. And they reached the Indians. That was the plan. She took the gospel to them. She began to take verses of Scripture and put them in their language. But something was missing. It was her husband. Jim went there. He got speared in the river. Happened to Abraham. Genesis 12. The Lord tells him to leave. Er, he does. He travels to the land. The Lord says, this is the land. Here it is. Builds an altar. The Lord appears to him. Wonderful. But something's missing. What is it? It's groceries. How are you going to stay? Genesis 12.10, there's a famine in the land. Is that what God does? He births you? Brings you to faith and then uh, wraps you up in swaddling clothes and leaves you some cold morning on the steps someplace with a little card. Now you're on your own. That's what Abraham needed to learn. What did he do in that situation? Did he trust the Lord with all of his heart? Or did he lean on his own understanding? Well, we know the story, don't we? In a flit of panic, he leaves. He goes down into Egypt. And down in Egypt is the Pharaoh. And down in Egypt is a servant girl by the name of Hagar. So I'm really impressed here with the calmness of Samuel when you come up zeros. This is a seasoned man of God. And we can learn from him. So what does he do? He stays in place. He stays on the word that was delivered to him. Nothing is easy in the world that we have to live by faith when it's so easy to walk by sight. Knowing for certain that God had sent him, he asked Jesse, verse 11, are these all your boys? And Jesse says, well, the youngest still remains. Now, if Jesse were a Scotsman, he would have said, well, we still have a wee one thought by Jesse to be so insignificant that when the great prophet of God would come to your little town, your little village where the, where the light swings in the wind as it crosses the road, where there's a filling station and maybe a small convenience store and a few houses, and the great prophet of God is there in Bethlehem and you thought so little of your son, your least son, to not bring him? I know people like Jesse. Been around them, heard them. It's, uh, they would tell you it's like they have a sixth sense. Uh, this amazing ability. They can tell you who the lightweights are, and who the significant players are. First, we should learn as believers. You never know the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of any person. 
how it's going to manifest itself in that person and that person's personality. You and I have no idea of that power in a life. And for one to categorize a believer as a, a lightweight, you know, he doesn't have the equipment. I've heard that. Well, that's pure arrogance. And a believer needs to be ashamed. Second, we have no idea what God's plan is. You don't know what he's going to do with that person. Howard Hendricks, his book, on Elijah, tells a story of a student that sat on his back row and slept through most of his classes. And he would file out with all the other students, and he'd walk by Hendricks' desk, and the professor would say, wonder what God can do with him. Well, he graduated, took a church up in the Midwest, gets a letter, uh, Hendricks does, from him. He sees the letterhead, recognizes the church. Oh yeah, I remember that church, old, old church, farming community. That's probably a good place for him. And the letter was an invitation to come whenever you're in the area. Well. About a year, year and a half later, he was in the area, so he followed up. They exchanged correspondence, set a date. Now, the student, his former student, wasn't there, but he gets there only to find all this construction going on. They're building a brand new sanctuary in this old church. There's cars everywhere. He said, I got up, I, I preached my heart out to a packed audience. There were chairs in the aisle. And uh, I walked off the podium, and there was a big guy, six foot six, firm handshake. That's pretty good preaching, son. You ever heard our pastor? <laughs> Look at this first description of David. Here it is, shepherding the flock. Let's make a mental note. The first image of David in the Scriptures is a shepherd. The first image of Joseph, son of Jacob, Genesis 37-2, is a shepherd. The work of a shepherd is kind of like a security guard. Except a security guard uh, in his little office. Uh, you step in in the summer and it's freezing cold from the air conditioning unit in the window. Or there's a big space heater in the little office of the security guard, but not for the shepherd. No, he's out in the open air and he's exposed all the time to the monotonous Elements. Genesis 31, Jacob describes for us just what that life is like. He said, the heat consume me in the day and the cold at night and sleep fled from my eyes. Heat. Uh, you all are just tougher than I am. I get down here in the summer, I can't breathe. Uh, you're just tougher. Uh, it's like a blanket. Dan told me a story. He and Jim Boyce left the building, walking across the parking lot, and suddenly Boyce just stopped and said, it just doesn't go away, does it? <laughs> the cold, it, it even gets cold here sometimes, a little bit late into the night, and that's painful. There's no cold like Chicago cold. I thought I knew cold until I stepped out of the airport and faced Chicago cold. Nothing like that cold. And sleep. 
A guy asked me one time, Mike, what was it like to study under the giants of the Word at Dallas Seminary? I gave him an answer he wasn't really prepared for. I said, well, I was sleepy all the time. <laughs> now look at this. Samuel said, send. Send for him. Remember now, key words in a narrative are not just repetitious words, but they're actually supercharged words that carry the story along. Think of it as a current that's running under water. You don't see it at the surface. And that's what key words do. They, they supercharge the story and they carry it along for us and make it brighter and bolder. Our first key word was the word rejected. And then last time it was to see, seeing. And now here, here's the third, to send. That was the command of God to Samuel. There it is, verse 1. The command of the Lord, go and I will send you to Jesse. To my surprise, this verb to leave, um, it's uh, translated in your text to sit. It has a lot of discussion about it, and it's always in the grammars down at the bottom of the page in the fine print. It's, uh, it's translated this way, to turn away or to turn to do something else. It's probably the force of the latter to turn to another agenda item. So I'll try to put it in the context. Uh, the we would be either, uh, that would be Jesse and the prophet, or that would be Jesse and the family. And remember, we're at this feast, this ziva, going on, there's laughter, there's celebration, and Samuel says to Jesse, think of an exclamation point. Um, we are not leaving until you bring him, the son that I haven't seen. That's the idea. So the text says, verse 12, um, Jesse brought him. So here's my question. Who was that exactly that brought him? Well, well we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. That's right. It doesn't. But you see, that's the one I want to be. I want to be that nameless, faceless volunteer. That's who I want to be in the story. Uh, verse 1, to sin. Verse 11, to sin. And these key words, if you start meditating on them and think about them, and here's what my meditation led me to. Isaiah 6. Now, you don't need to turn to Isaiah 6. Mark Newman's Sunday school class knows Isaiah 6. It is one of the predominant visions of God in all the Scriptures. He goes into the temple, and suddenly there it is. Bang! In three dimensions. The Lord on His throne. And so awesome and grand that the train of his cape, it fills the entire temple. And, uh, and then comes the voice from the throne using our word right here. Who shall I send? And the prophet says, send me. Asking for a volunteer. 
Who will be the nameless, faceless volunteer? The insignificant one. That's who I want to be. One in obscurity. Just volunteering for a great God and for what He wants to accomplish in my lifetime in a space and time. In a chapter that has had much to say about seeing, we now have something actually to see here. Think of Samuel's pounding heart as he's waiting for this little shepherd boy to arrive. And here he is, ruddy. Same word used of Esau, Genesis 25, 25. So he's reddish brown, beautiful of eyes, literally good for looking. That's the same word that was used of Moses for the effect and the wisdom of God for Pharaoh's daughter. That little basket among the reeds and she opens it up and she sees that beautiful little boy and he's crying. She's not about to dump him in the Nile. The voice of Samuel that was patient to wait. To not lean on his own understanding. To not panic but to wait. And the voice that he waited for, arise and anoint him for this is he. You see, God was looking for a heart. And we found him. A heart of his own nature. A heart that God had already changed before the prophet came on the scene. And there's no doubt in my mind that if you and I had been there at this moment, we would have been shocked. I mean, Saul was so tall. And this one is so small. But we know you don't despise the day of small things, do we? The Lord Jesus on an afternoon was looking down and watching people give money at the temple. And there was this widow who brought her tiny mites. Now, Think of all the activity going on at the temple. Animals are being slaughtered. People are talking to the priests. Think of all the activity in Jerusalem. People arguing at the gate of the city over goats and oxen. All those conversations. Think of the kings and places and palaces everywhere in the ancient world, and all those conversations. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus Christ was looking at tiny mites. That's what got His attention. I was reading through the Gospels, trying to read through the Bible, a few years back, and just not focusing on anything in particular, just kind of reading through it and rapidly. And suddenly, I just closed my Bible and shook my head and said, you know, there's one thing about those disciples. They were consistent. Consistently wrong. And wrong about everything. Oh, there was that high moan above the clouds where Peter says, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. But how long did that last? Till He opened His mouth again. And then it dawned on me. 
And suddenly it humbled me. I got up behind my desk. I, I got down on my knees. And I said, Lord, thank you for being so kind, so gracious, so forgiving, so long suffering with me, patient. Because you see, that's what he was for them. Why? Because he knew that what they would become. Remember, become? It's a transition word. It's a movement word. He knew what they would one day be. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. There are three anointings of David. This is the first by Samuel the prophet. The second by the men of Judah to be king of the house of Judah. 2 Samuel 2, 4. And third, king over Israel. And that is... 2 Samuel 5, 3. Interesting about those anointings, if you begin to think about it, each one confirms the next, that confirms the next, that confirms the next. Kind of like those dolls. You know, you, you have the big one, and then you open the top of that, and there's a smaller one, and you open the top of that, and there's a smaller one there. Consider what the Scriptures are teaching us. You're looking for a person? Well, look for confirmations. One after another, after another, and another. Each will bear witness to the other. David, before long, is going to stand in the tent of Saul. And he's going to bear witness to his prowess as a warrior. The paw of the lion. The paw of the bear. And this uh, thousand pound armor covered lug that stands out there shouting at you every morning. I'll do him the same way. The rush of the Spirit here. It's different than the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 at Pentecost. I remember that from my notes 50 years ago with S. Lewis Johnson in theology proper. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God hovered, that's Genesis 1-1, hovered over the waters, or He would come, come upon, like Samson, In Judges 14, for mighty feats, mighty acts. But notice this last phrase of the verse. From this day forward. See that? Not for a particular moment or not for a particular task. No, this is permanent. This is going to be over Him, with Him, around Him, through Him, in some miraculous way till the day He dies. So, what does that mean? We're looking for a heart. We're looking for a king. God described Him as a king for Myself. And we found Him. And now we know that He is one in the same with God's own nature. And He is also equipped with God's own power. Look at that name David right there in your text. It is associated with the Spirit. Daniel Block is a contemporary scholar. He calls this verse 
the most significant turning point in the history of Israel. Why? Because it is the transfer of divine authority to David. For those who like to focus on numbers, we might consider the numbers here. We know seven to be the perfect number. Seven to be the climax. It's the end of creation. Seven is the zenith. So what is eight? This is the eighth son. Well, it doesn't go eight, nine, ten. No, it's one through seven. And then eight starts the progression all over again. What we have here in eight is the starting over. The new beginning. And here's our man, David. Here's what we need to focus on and remember from this time forward because the application is all over us as individuals. This man will be invincible for as long as he serves others and not himself. And now the close. Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Pretty profound, wouldn't you say? I mean, look at your contrast back at verse 11. We are not anyway in any means or reason going to leave. The effect of that in Jesse's ear, he just delivered to the prophet his best and brightest. But, no, there's... We're coming to the agenda now. And here it is. The end of the story. The end of the scene. He leaves. But you see, that's what great servants of the Lord do. They come to a place and they're vigorously focused with energy and time and effort upon that service at a place. They may be president of the Kiwanis Club. They may set the curve at the tennis courts, at the club. But their focus is in their service. That's where their energy is. That's where their passion, that's where their drive is. Now I think I think we ought to build a plaque or a monument. I mean, this is big time stuff, you being here. Samuel? He doesn't have time for that. He's gone. The only monuments that are built anywhere in this book is the one that Saul built for himself. You see, great servants come and they serve and they leave. And they're interested in the work that's there at that time. And oftentimes when we say they leave, they go to heaven. That's been the history of this church. Men that have been here before, that have shaped our lives, ministered to us, dried our tears, encouraged us, gave us the Word. But most importantly, is that we witnessed them, their participation, and it affected us. And I, 
I want to be like them. That's the life of the servant. And you know what? It's very, very powerful. So, we finished our fourth lesson. So before we break and a miracle of miracles, I'm going to get us out on time today. Um, let's consider where we are and where we're going forward. We now have two kings, both chosen by God, both anointed by the prophet Samuel. One is the true king. One has been rejected. But that one rejected is going to still occupy the corner office. He's going to continue to have the, the flags and the trumpets and the cavalry and the big tents. And everybody's going to move at His orders. It's a time of great confusion. How would you know who's the real deal? Two individuals that we'll study in the future. The first comes from the most unlikely of places. That's often the way God does things, doesn't He? The first will come from the house of Saul. Not an official. No. No, His very own Son. And He'll say to David, You're the king. You're the king. He gets it. I love to be involved in people that get it. They really get it. They don't just hang around the big circle. No, they're in it because they got it. And how important something is and what's going on. The second is a valiant woman. A Proverbs 31 woman. You remember the book of Proverbs. And she's going to tell David in 1 Samuel 25, you're the king. You're the real king. In a day and a time when his face was in every post office in the ancient Near East, wanted. He was a fugitive on the run. But she'll tell him, no, you're the king. Now think about this with me. She is in a horrible marriage. So horrible, we could call that bondage. That's what she's in. She's married to a guy by the name of Nabal. He's a fool. That's her whole world, being with a fool. But God's going to deliver her out of that. Nabal's going to die real quickly. And David is going to remember her profession. Her profession. You're the king. And he is going to swoop down and take her as a bride. Now, when you're a bride in the ancient Near East, you become a co heir. You're inside the family now. All right, title, and interest is with you now as a co heir. Which means she has everything he has. You see, 
That's what the Old Testament does for us. Little lights, little flickers, shadows of things to come that teach us all about Him and our relationship to Him. That's the value of the Old Testament. And it's all about the One. The One, the One and only Jesus the Christ. Believe in Him. Trust in Him. Do not leave this room without knowing that you have cast your lot upon Him completely. And you will have that relationship. And all of those benefits attributed to you as well. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study today. Thank you for this class, the love of the Scriptures for the people at Believer's Chapel. What a blessing. Strengthen hearts and minds to follow Your Word, to wait upon Your Word, because blessing is around the corner. Good things are are always ahead for those who wait to hear His Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.